This yeah. is true. <laughs> Um, all right, so this is not about PDFs. This is about websites. That's kind of what I specialize in. Um, and this is kind of a focus on large websites, but really, I think, any size website. And, you know, focusing on remediation, but also, like, depending on where you are in your accessibility journey, I think you can probably find some benefit from this, hopefully. Um, all right, so my name is April. My pronouns are she, they. Um, that's my dog, Dash. You might see him tonight if this venue is dog friendly. Um, and he loves people, so if you see him, say hi. Um, I work as a technical architect at um, an agency called Mighty Citizen. So we do branding, marketing, and websites for mission-driven organizations. I'm happy to talk about that a little bit later if anyone's interested. And before this, I worked at an agency that worked with destinations. So we built Drupal websites at scale. We had you know, thousands of pages, huge teams of editors. And so you know, my journey into accessibility started about seven years ago. Um, one of our clients approached us actually with a 50-page PDF. And it had like all of these different accessibility issues. And they told us to fix all of these issues. Um, so what had happened was some companies sent them this list of issues and kind of meant for it to be overwhelming. And they basically said that our client was gonna get sued unless they went and fixed all of these issues, which I guess is you know a way to market your services. It's not the way I'd choose, but it is, I guess, a tactic. Um, but instead of going with that company, our client came to us and said like, hey, can you actually fix this? Because we have an ongoing engagement and then as the newest person on the team, it just kind of got passed around until it ended up with me. Um, so I was like, yeah, sure, I can fix this. Um, but as a developer, I kind of had this perspective, like I knew kind of what the underlying code was. And as I went through this report, like I saw that a lot of these issues were different variations of the same couple issues coming up over and over. So what I did was I broke them down into like categories and types and kind of broke them down into like chunks of work by, you know, this is a design issue, this is a um, you know, color contrast issue. And we were able to kind of take that into like, you know, chunks and address a lot of the PDF. So, I mean, I didn't realize this at the time, but like I was breaking this down according to WCAG guideline. Like at that time, I didn't even know what WCAG was. And, you know, I thought that fixing all these things would, you know, magically make the website accessible, um, which is not true. But, you know, this was kind of like the initial learning for me and kind of like the start of this framework that I would use and would eventually refine as we got more and more of this work. Because, you know, as you've seen, like a lot of more people are paying attention to this, which is great. Um, so the goal here is to share what's worked for me and what I've seen. I want to be descriptive, not prescriptive, because you know every website's different, every team will be different, um, everyone's capabilities will be different. So hopefully you kind of take away some things that are helpful to you. Um, I'll try to save some time to share things that might have been helped, like you've seen that might be helpful to others. Um, so get through this. Um, so we've already done the introduction. Um, I'll go over a couple like ground rules and assumptions we should have in place for you to be successful in this work. Um, then we'll go over how to test or audit your site so you know kind of where you stand. That way you know where you're going and you can work on prioritizing that work. Um, then we'll talk about actually doing that work and how to measure progress over time. And then hopefully we'll have time to go like a little bit beyond compliance. What are some next steps you can take as part of your accessibility journey? Um, so the biggest thing we need is some sort of support or buy-in at the higher level. Uh, so I won't get into like why accessibility is important. I think we're all here and we can agree on that anyway. If not, there are tons of great resources out there that will give you the case for accessibility. And if you don't have that leadership support, those are really good things to present to them. Um, you know, some some teams have like you know the ethical reasons for pursuing accessibility, and some have more of like the legal reasons. It really doesn't matter why, but you know, as long as you have that high-level support, that's going to really help your work um, over time. And then, on a more practical level, like you should have some commitment to doing this work. And what this looks like, you know, it can be like two hours a week, or it can be a scope. You know, it really depends on your team and you know how much space you have. But it's important to like set that goal and use that time so that you can make progress. 
Um, so you might not have a traditional team or access to specialized roles, but that's okay because this work can come from anywhere. Um, I actually think it's better to not rely on experts or a single person because it's good to like disseminate that work and those learnings and then it starts to become part of your process. So you're doing less remediation and more like accessibility is just part of what we do. And then the fourth point is that you can have a fully compliant website but still not be fully accessible. Like we were talking about alt text. You can have alt text for all of your images, but if I wrote it, it would not be accessible. It would just say like ball or something like that. Um, so compliance is only a part of the process. And um, that brings me to my final point. Like accessibility is a journey. So there's always something you can do to take it to the next level. Um, as I mentioned, you'll see some things here that might not work for you or exactly what you need. Hopefully you'll find some things that are what you are looking for. Um, but you know, you're the one who knows like your team, your processes, your website. So take what works for you. Like this is very much choose your own adventure style. Um, I did want to get into accessibility overlays before we start. Is anyone familiar with this guy here? Seen him around? Um, yeah, like the this is a um, like line of code that people say will make your site accessible and what it does is it has like different settings that you can use. Um, if anyone is like thinking about using this or has a client that wants to use this, uh, this is straight from one of the websites. The answer is don't use this. <laughs> um, they're not useful otherwise we wouldn't be here like there's no you know, magic solution that will make your site accessible without effort. And not only are they not useful, they make they can make access worse. Um, if you go to these links that have more information on kind of like why exactly they don't address accessibility barriers, um, a lot of disabled users will actually block these tools too, which kind of defeats the purpose. It's like, who are we building these tools for? It's just kind of like a you know, the easy button. It doesn't really do anything. It just says that was easy. Um, so yeah, just to be aware, um, check out these two links for kind of more information. If, you know, someone is thinking about using it, like if a client says, hey, what about this? And then just one more thing before we get into testing. I think we have probably all heard of the WCAG at some point. Um, you don't have to know too much about it. I don't want to get too far into the weeds with this. Um, but basically, you know, it stands for Web Content Accessibility Guidelines. It's published by the Web Accessibility Initiative. So they define three levels of accessibility standards and kind of depending on which level you want to hit, there are 12 to 14 guidelines. Um, and they're all organized around four main principles. So if you don't know anything else about WCAG, just know they're like the technical standards. So they're the basis for a lot of the testing tools that I'll go through in a moment. Um, but I do recommend when we first start out is to define, because these tools use this, um, define what standard we want to hit, so that way we know what we want to test against. Um, the current WCAG standard is 2.1. There is 2.2 coming very soon with a couple of updated standards, um, but 2.1 and 2.0 are still like really solid, so I wouldn't use that, like, I wouldn't let that be a blocker for you. Um, and then the three levels are A, AA, and AAA, with A being like the minimum compliance and then AAA being the highest level. So depending on what your target, there are specific guidelines you should meet. Um, and they're all listed like right out here. So this is the WCAG quick reference, which I think there's a link to there. Um, basically what I do is I go, I, you can filter by standard and level and what it will do is it will show you what the guidelines are to meet that standard and that level. Um, so it's good to define it early on just so that you can have a targeted approach and you're not just kind of like fixing things without knowing what your goal is. Um, and as you kind of go through this work, um, you can always revisit this and go for like a higher level of compliance if that's where you want to do with your website. Um, so once you've figured out what standards you want to hit, you can narrow down like your testing parameters. Most of the tools, like I said, will specify which guideline it falls under. Um, but if you're targeting like an A level issue and you see a triple A issue, 
you know, it might not be worth your effort to fix that like right away, but it's something you might want to keep in mind as, you know, this is a barrier at a different level. Um, but yeah, when you're just starting out, like you would want to hit your lower targets first because they do all build upon one another. Um, so if you wanted to be at A com or double A compliance, you would have to hit all of the things at the A level anyway. So it's always good to start at that lower target and just kind of build up. And then I have two types of testing here, which you might have seen at some point, um, automated testing, manual testing, and then broke down automated testing into three categories. Um, so I have specific, broad, and site-wide. When I say specific testing tools, I mean things that address specific issues. So usually these are like plugins that you can download and they can be mapped out to a specific WCAG guideline. Um, so things to check your color contrast, your heading structure, your page regions. Um, I recommend making this part of your process as early on as possible. So, you know, part of your dev and design process um, and part of your QA process. Or, you know, not all of us have that luxury. If you're past that phase and you have a website, come back to these <coughs> once you've kind of taken a look at the broader issues. So getting into the broader testing tools, um, the ones listed here, I have Wave, Axe Dev Tools, Google Developer Tools, Site Improve, you might have heard of these. Um, they're mostly free browser plugins or extensions. So these are tools that will test regions of your page, like sections, or your entire page, um, rather than you know, picking out specific issues. But basically they go through and they will pull out all of those issues and categorize them for you. So, you know, by guideline or by WCAG standard. Um, so these are really handy when you're just starting out and you want to understand what issues you have on your page. Um, the thing is they're not very targeted. So you'll get a lot of repetition. So for example, if you had 100 links on a page that had a color contrast issue, it'll just mark them as 100 different issues when in reality you would go in, update one color variable in your style sheet, and that would fix all of those instances. Um, so when you use these, use them with that lens in mind and look for those patterns. Uh, so here's an example with DQ's Axe Dev Tools. This is, again, one of the browser extensions I mentioned. It's showing me that there are 48 issues on this page, and I think you can see my mouse, but um, you can see it's like grouping them by issue. So if I were to go through one of each of these issues and expand them, it would tell me more about it, why it's important, what guideline it's falling under, and then it would show me, you know, there's a little number on the right, um, like that's how many instances there are, and it would show me exactly where the instances are. So this is a good way to understand the issues at a page level. Um, however, not all pages are going to be the same, especially with these larger websites and you're dealing with different content types and site sections. Um, there might be overlap as you go through the different pages on your site, but it's not going to catch every instance of every issue. So if you wanted to do that, there are site-wide testing tools you can use. The trade-off is it, they can be expensive, um, you know, compared to the tools that I just showed that are free. So I know we mentioned Site Improve, you know, DQ Axe Monitor, Level Access, Dynamapper. These are all just kind of similar tools that will scan each page on your site and automatically categorize them for you. And um, they'll also like track them over time. So as you go through and fix these things, it'll show you progress. Um, so here's an example with Site Improve. This is just their dashboard when you log into their accessibility um, dashboard. It gives you like this initial score here and then it'll show you things you can do to improve your score. It'll track it over time. Um, I wouldn't pay attention to the score itself because it's pretty subjective. Um, it's like this weird gamification thing they do. They like have, I don't know if you could read that, but it's like you can get 20 points if you fix all these issues. Um, but like what does that mean? But I would pay attention to the progress over time because you know you want to make sure the work you're doing is actually having meaningful impact. Um, so you can look at you can use Site Improve. It'll show you like the page level issues, which is similar to what the DQ screenshot was. Um, or you can see here like they group them by issue as well, but like for all of the different pages. And again, there will be a lot of repetition because like, the goal of this tool is to just catch as many instances as possible on your site. 
but they're really handy for you know, giving you like this baseline, helping you understand where you're at, and helping you track over time. Um, so the thing is, automated testing tools like this, they only catch about 30% of accessibility issues, which you know, is not a lot. For the rest, we need to manually test. And when I say manual testing, I mean going through your site, you know, tabbing through everything. Can you access your content with just a keyboard? Um, you know, zooming in on your pages. Is your content getting cut off when you zoom into 200%? Um, screen reader testing, uh, using a screen reader on your site, even if it's just like a quick Mac voiceover, um, seeing if your content makes sense using a screen reader, and then kind of like a manual content review, like I was saying with the alt tags, like does your content make sense, is it understandable? Um, so again, this is all part of like this audit process, which can be overwhelming, especially because these days websites aren't really layouts anymore, you know, they're components, they're blocks, they're paragraphs. And they're a lot more flexible than they used to be. So if you go through one page and fix everything on that one page, it doesn't necessarily mean that all your other pages are you know, fixed and good to go. Um, so we do need like a smarter way to kind of approach the testing and our fixes, and you know, that'll help us track our progress. Um, so when it comes to testing using those tools that I just went through, there are a couple ways to organize that approach. Um, for me, ideally, it's like starting with your basic site architecture or your IA. Um, so with Drupal, you've got like your content types, your paragraphs, your views. Um, I'd like to break those down, you know, identify what they are and test against them. And hopefully they're templated, which means that if you fix one instance, you should fix all the other instances on your site. Um, I find it helpful to have, you know, I don't know if people have component libraries, but if you don't, um, I'll instead just have like links to real world examples where you can find those and reference those and any variations. So like here you can see there's like a card on the left and a card on the right. Um, and just kind of make a list of those so that you're not going through your site and testing, like going through hundreds of pages. Um, but yeah, we should always test against real content when you can because that's what the users are seeing and experiencing. Um, but if you don't have this type of build plan laid out, if you could take some time to break it out, I would. If not, you can always go by sitemap. So that would look like taking your top pages, testing them, categorizing your work, which I'll get into in a few. Um, but the goal there is to have fixed, you know, your most important pieces of content. And then, kind of similarly, user journey is helpful. Like, this might make more sense if you've got limited budget or resource addressing your most important user flows first. So, you know, the sitemap and user journey, they won't be as comprehensive as, you know, going by all of the pieces of your site. But depending on just your site and resources, it might make more sense. Or you can do some combination of both. So I'll usually start with one and then kind of supplement with the other. And then as you go through your testing, you'll want to document these so you can fix and track them. Um, again, whether you're going by page or by component, you still want to track. Um, I like to start out by building out a spreadsheet with kind of these columns. So you know, name your issue, describe it categorize it, you know, is this like a design issue, is it a development issue or a content issue, um, what guideline it falls under. If you're using a lot of these tools, it will give you that information already, so that should make your life a little bit easier. Um, is it a global issue? Usually you'd want to prioritize that because they're obviously everywhere. Um, is it specific to a feature? That would be kind of my second priority because they're still repeated. Or is it a one-off, which, you know, depending on how difficult it is, it might not be worth it to address right away. Um, effort, so how much effort is involved in fixing this? Um, and priority, how high priority is it? When I think of priority, I think of, you know, how big of an access barrier is this for users? And then assign someone or a role responsible for fixing it. So it could be someone in your team, it could be the client. Um, or if it's a third party, you know, note that because you might not even be able to fix it. But definitely something to note in when you're documenting. 
Um, so once you have all these, you can kind of sort and filter depending on how you want to tackle these issues. And this is a good baseline for like tracking over time. But this probably means you have like hundreds of issues listed. So you need to figure out how to prioritize them. Um, some places to start to narrow it down, you know, frequent and recurring issues, things you see over and over, like I mentioned, are probably just a handful of issues that you need to fix in one spot that you'll fix, that will end up just propagating everywhere. Um, obviously, any major roadblocks, major barriers to accessibility, things like keyboard traps, things that can't be accessed with a mouse you'd want to prioritize. And then any quick wins are really good for shortening your list. Um, so here's a screenshot of a lighthouse audit. I'm trying to kind of represent as many different tools as possible, but most of them will give you something similar to, the, to this. Um, so when I run this tool, I see that I have at least eight issues on this page, but really once you take a look at them, they're all the same thing. It's saying that this orange experiences heading has very low contrast. So for me, if I'm documenting this, I would log it as, you know, one issue. But you know, this site has a page for every major city in the USA. It's got a site for, or a page for every state and so on. And then this component, like this nearby experiences component exists on every single page. So you can see how like if you're using something like Site Improve, this could add up to thousands of issues. But in reality, like you would get a developer and, you know, maybe work with your design team to come up with a more accessible color contrast and then you would update maybe one color um, and that takes care of that. So I would call this a quick win for a recurring issue. So for me, like this is a no brainer. This would be kind of higher on my priority list. So as you go through your site, you know, you want to look out for these types of issues because they do go a long way in just narrowing down your list. Um, then once you can distill that information, you can actually work on getting it fixed. This is more kind of geared towards like PMs who are creating the tasks, but just some information on like what to give to your team, like the person who's fixing this. A lot of it is going to come from that um, document your findings slide. So, you know, you would name and describe the issue. You would, um, you know, what, how specific is this? Is it global page or feature specific? Um, links to instances of the page and maybe any variations if you have variations just as much context as possible um, screenshots some folks depending on what the issue is you could do a video recording or just get on a call and do a screen share um, but yeah as much context as to like what the actual issue is um, and you know why does it matter what's the barrier that it's presenting to users and then for suggested fixes, I try not to be too prescriptive here because, you know, instead of saying fix this by putting this piece of code in, I like to work with the developer or content or designer just to have them suggest the fix. But I will link to resources saying like, well, this is the issue and here's some potential ways we could fix it. That helps kind of disseminate learnings amongst the team, helps get them thinking about it more, and um, is just a good way to kind of get them being the expert in, you know, in this world. And then when it comes to, uh, like to how you want to organize all of this work, a couple ways you can go about it. Um, there's you can go by guideline, by feature, or by page. So if you're going like Assigning work by guideline, this is really useful if you're using something like Site Improve, like those site-wide testing tools, because it's automatically lumping all of these issues by guideline for you. So I think this screenshot is from UsableNet, which is a similar tool. Um, but you can see here, it's they've already categorized all of your issues. So if you were to click into one of these categories, it would just list out what the issues are. Um, if you're not using a site-wide testing tool, um, it's this is probably more useful if you have gone through and done that categorization work that way you can just narrow down your focus you know you could say this sprint we're going to work on this guideline this sprint we're going to work on this guideline that way it's kind of fresh in your brain you're not trying to relearn how to fix the issue um, but it does mean you have to have had that good like organizational work done 
If you don't have that in place, it might be helpful to go by feature instead. So instead of doing like one guideline at a time, you'd focus on each component or your modules or whatever you call them on your site. Um, and then just doing like a combination of automated testing and manual testing at each component level to catch what are all of the issues that are present in this block and then focus on fixing that at a time. Um, this does make your testing a lot easier because instead of going to like all these different pages and finding different instances, like you're just focusing on one component and any variations you have of it, and then hopefully, you know, ideally once you've fixed it, you can just move on to the next component and not have to really revisit it too much. Um, so again, like two different ways to make your site more accessible. I like to do a combination of both, um, like starting with one and then narrowing down to the other. Um, but again, if you can't do either of those for some reason, you can always just go by page. It's not going to be as methodical or comprehensive, and but you should still be able to make some good progress that should trickle down to the rest of your site. So if I were to go by pages, I would pick pages that are as different as possible and present different content. And if you have different content types, you know, try to get a representative page for each content type. Like, just the goal is to kind of catch different issues and not really focus on the same thing over and over. Um, I usually use this if I'm doing things like dashboards or like internal systems, things that only have a few pages but might be more complex um, because that like it's just easier to just go page by page. Um, so a lot of what I just went through should be the basis for how you measure your progress over time. So whether you're doing spreadsheets or tickets, um, you should be able to track what you've fixed in a given time frame. And however you framed your testing initially, I would continue doing that. You know, keep testing your site, get a snapshot of your progress, and make sure that you're actually making progress. Um, these tools, like site-wide scanning tools, I think this is DQ. Um, Again, another you know, tool that will monitor your progress over time. And those are nice because it does it for you automatically. Um, and then you can, this is just showing Lighthouse. You can use tools like Lighthouse every once in a while just to kind of get a gauge on how you're doing. But I wouldn't use that as like my one key indicator. I would use you know, some combination of you know, all of these things. And then once you've gone through this a couple of times, um, like I said, this is really just one small part of your journey. You can always go back, pick a higher target, kind of keep revisiting this. Um, as I mentioned, compliance isn't, doesn't necessarily mean accessibility. So you know, I'd recommend user testing with actual disabled folks. Um, you'll probably be exposed to a lot of new perspectives that you might not have considered before. Um, and then working on developing best practices for your team, making this a part of your process, kind of shifting left, thinking about accessibility first. This will save you a lot of what I just went through. So, you know, it'll kind of save you more remediation time in the long run. And then hiring disabled folks, just getting them involved. Um, so I do have two good resources here if you want ideas. One of them is actually from DrupalCon. Um, but once you dive into this work, you'll start to see areas where you might want to pursue next. So it's always good to be keeping an eye out for these and just you know, striving to be better and more inclusive. Um, if you want these links, I do have these slides available at this link. Um, and then you know, feel free to reach out. I would love feedback on this. This is actually the first time I'm giving this specific presentation. Um, so, you know, love to hear what's worked, what hasn't worked. My handle is Dungeon Jumper on most social media. Um, I, it's pretty unique, so I don't think anyone else has it. Um, yeah. Anyone have any questions, comments, things that have worked for you, things you've seen? Yeah, yeah. I, I wondered if you could go into accessibility overlays a bit more. So mm -hmm. we, when I was on the Drupal project I mentioned in my presentation, we briefly did, we did have one conversation about them with our client and the accessibility specialist. We very quickly 
uh, we very quickly got told they were not a good solution and we didn't mm -hmm. go with them. Um, and I had heard similarly that people with disabilities will block the overlays, but I don't know why and I don't know much about them. So I was wondering, I mean, I know you have the fact sheets there, but I was mm -hmm. wondering if you can just talk a bit more about why they're problematic in terms of not solving the problems they were mm -hmm. presumably built for. Yeah. Um so again, like an overlay is a piece of code that you put on your site and the goal is to give you like kind of different options to change your settings. Um, the issue is they fail to address like, you know, the underlying problem. So things like alt text, like they can't put in alt text for you. Um, pro proper labeling, like captions and transcriptions. There's, and keyboard access. Um, so, you know, every site is so unique that there isn't really a good one size fits all for this. Um, and a lot of users who rely on this technology, they already have those tools. So they've already got software to navigate the web and like use the features already built into the browser. So, you know, again, like what, what's the value on top of it? So it kind of gives people a false sense of accessibility when in reality it doesn't do much or doesn't actively hurts some users. Yep. What does it actually do? Like, if, if it doesn't do any of those things to pass an accessibility, like it won't change color contrast, it won't add any of those things, like how does it then? Yeah, I think it could, but really that's just one issue out of many. Um, and I, I haven't actually like used one of these before, but I think, you know, a lot of like, um, when I have seen it, it's tools that Kind of magnify text, which is something you can do without that. Um, you know, there there are tools already that kind of render this unnecessary. Yep. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you're 100 percent right. Um, you know, a lot of times when I've watched a uh, user with disabilities interact with the web, one of the things that's really rebellious rebel towards. I went to a, a session, and there are like three users with visual disabilities from low vision to no vision, and like basically the way they navigate the site was like with no low vision. Basically she just zoomed in everything and was almost like one letter per screen on her iPhone and just mm -hmm. kind of scrolling around. And one of the important things for that low vision user was having like a logical flow so she could figure out where the next place was. So she'd have to basically look out at a page at a visibility that she couldn't read all the stuff say, okay, I think it's about there what I want, and then zoom in there, and then go letter by letter to figure it out. When, you, when you've got someone with a screen reader, like a lot of times it's super important to have like proper structure, because they're going to mm -hmm. bounce heading to heading to heading. If you don't have headings, uh, you know, uh, an overlay is not going to be able to say, well, that, that thing that is visually a heading, it's not, it's not an actual heading, so you can't yeah. figure that out. The accessibility overlay is it's fascinating to me then from like a user perspective and a design perspective because it it so does not it seems like it completely fails at the the job that it was built to do so to speak and so mm -hmm. I'm here it's like I'm honestly kind of fascinated about how it even like how it even got here and how it became such a problem for the presumably the people that it was supposed to help. I think really good marketing. And maybe a little bit of fear tactics, like I mentioned, you know, that company that had approached one of our clients and said, you know, you're going to get sued if you don't go with our services. Um, I think it's a little bit of that as well. Like, you know, you hear all these stories of people getting sued and here's a really quick way because, you know, where are people who kind of magically come up with an accessibility budget um, if they don't already have one? Um, so, you know, you see something like this that kind of promises that, and there are sites that actually, I think the, one of these links has mentioned that some sites still do get sued. So you're still you know, at risk when you go with these overlays because they don't address all of the barriers. What about yep. uh, accessibility wages? I think that's kind of the same thing. So what would happen when you click this is like it will bring up this big panel of different settings that you could change. Is that kind of what you're thinking yeah. of? Yeah. Yeah, it's the same thing. Fine, fine. Yep. Yes. 
Uh, so, what's your, what are your thoughts on kind of setting a frequency for um, ongoing testing and review? Like sort of, how do you think about that for different organizations and different sizes of websites? I guess it depends. Um, well, yeah, it's kind of a non-answer, but um, usually, you know, if you're not doing something like site improve because you know those tools will kind of, I think you'd have to go in and like trigger a rescan, but those kind of effortlessly effortlessly do them for you. Um, with kind of, if you're doing it yourself, going through and retesting, I feel like. I would probably do that once I've, you know, I have my big spreadsheet of issues. Once I feel like I've tackled a bunch of work, I'll kind of go through and retest. Um, and usually, you know, some things will still come up because, you know, websites are, you know, they're not static, so um, there's always something. Um, yeah, I wouldn't prescribe, really. And again, it depends on how much time you're really dedicating. But when I feel like I've done the majority of work that I have already kind of identified, that's when I start to go through and think about retesting. Anyone else? Ready for lunch? Yes. <laughs> uh, I, I thought it was really nicely structured. Uh, good presentation. Great. Uh, really, really Thank nice. you. I liked, uh, I really liked how you talked about triaging the mm -hmm. different issues and prioritization. I thought that was really oh, nice. Oh, thanks. Um, and also uh, how to think about methodical testing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing I've noticed with all of these like accessibility presentations is, and I think you did this as well, like most of the ones I see are like, what is accessibility? Why is it important? But there's no like, okay, here's how you address it. Um, especially with big sites, like a lot of people will see these issues and they'll freak out. There's like, oh my God, there's a hundred issues on this page. I can't do this. Um, but really it's about kind of tackling it, like getting down and doing it. Cool. Um, do I have to hit this button again? Okay.